I think it is clear to believe in the power of ideas. Fresh thank you to the Manhattan Institute. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all here on behalf of the Manhattan Institute. We're very pleased uh, to have Mike Morris as our speaker today. Just uh, briefly, the format, I, I will introduce Mike, and he will uh, give his remarks. And then there'll be a brief discussion with Mike uh, up here and J.P. Donlin, uh, the editor-in-chief of Chief Executive Magazine. And after that brief discussion, we'll open it up to uh, questions uh, from the audience, as we always do at, at Manhattan Institute events. So that's the way the, the evening will run. Three years ago, the Manhattan Institute created our Center for Energy Policy and the Environment in order to push the energy debate toward market-oriented, scientifically sound policies. The creation of the center was inspired by senior fellow Peter Huber's 2005 book, The Bottomless Well. In the book, Peter explained how America's energy economy was shifting from fossil fuels to the electron. And he argued that the nation's top energy priority should be the construction of a 21st century national electric grid. Peter continued to make the case for an electron superhighway in a recent institute report entitled The Million Volt Answer to Oil. In the report, Peter made clear the need for a unified national electric grid, one that will, quote, let cheap power chase high demand around the clock and across the country and hasten our transition from an oil-based economy to an electron-based one. Our speaker tonight, Mike Morris, is one of the people most responsible for turning that vision into reality. Mike is chairman, president, and CEO of the American Electric Power Company, which owns the largest electricity transmission system in the nation and also ranks among the largest generators of electricity. Previous to joining American Electric, he was chairman, president, and CEO of Northeast Utility System, from 1997 to 2003, where he led the company through a period of tremendous growth and innovation. He also served as president and CEO of Consumers Energy, and prior to that, served as president of the Colorado Interstate Gas Company. With more than three decades of experience in the energy industry, no one is more qualified to speak with us this evening about the electrification of America's economy, the need for more diverse sources of energy, and the likely shape of energy policy in the new Obama administration. Please join me in welcoming Michael Morris. Thanks, Larry. Thanks for the introduction. And thanks to all of you for being here with us this evening on what I know you all think is a very cold day here in New York City. <laughs> Those of us in the energy business who are actually selling comfort to our customers are happy to have this kind of weather. <laughs> And before I left, I did get a report from our team that the 5.2 million customers that we serve throughout 11 states in the United States are all enjoying the lights being on. The issue of electrification of the world economy is clearly one that's well underway. Developed nations continue to grow, continue to change and utilize electricity in manufacturing, in communication, ultimately in transportation, and the developing nations of the world are beginning to do the things that we all did such a long time ago, and that is to electrify their economies, which allow for products to be made so much more effectively, cost-wise, energy consumption-wise, on the stage. <laughs> oh, hi, everybody. I can see you in the back row, too. <laughs> The whole matter of uh, the growth in electricity is one that makes so much sense. It's a higher value product than any of the raw fuels that feed us. But while the world continues to electrify and change that demand cycle, we all face some unique pressures. That is, how can we handle the demand on those fuels, which are finite in many instances? How can we handle the utilization of those fuels, which have the potential? if not done correctly, to impact the global warming challenge that we as a people face. And equally important in some of the introduction that Larry spoke to about the work that has been done by the Manhattan Institute, by Peter and others, leads us with a question of how do we do it appropriately? How do we see to it that we don't build too much of anything, too little of anything else? And how do we manage the flow of 
that electricity from its point of origin to its point of consumption. I personally think that a new administration at this particular point in time with a very aggressive plan toward how to change the energy model in this company is a great opportunity for all of us, an opportunity for us to rethink the model, whether it's right or wrong, whether Thomas Edison and George Westinghouse had good ideas or bad ideas, whether we can modernize that grid and make it so much more efficient. We clearly hear from this administration as it's about to uh, take over the reins of the country that they're dedicated to the concept of renewable, cleaner, more secure energy sources. We as a nation have been complaining about energy independence since the second term of Richard Nixon. Whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, every president has spoken to the tune of we need to be energy independent. And you know and I know that all of those decades past have led us to be more and more dependent on imported energy sources. The other thing that President Nixon did by signing the National Environmental Policy Act and being one of the early movers on the Clean Air Act, which ultimately became legislation later, said that we can do this and have a cleaner environment. So in the 70s to now the 2009 cycle, we have found over every decade the air has gotten cleaner. We as an industry in the electric side of production have addressed the issue of SOx and NOx and mercury, and will ultimately address the issue of carbon as soon as we have a piece of legislation that allows all that to happen. The whole notion of bringing renewables into the portfolio is an excellent idea. President-elect Obama is extremely aggressive on the concept of making full use of wind and solar and biotechnology. And we as an industry, our company in particular, supports that every bit as strongly as the administration does. The issue between what we would all like to do and what we are now able to do is what needs to be tackled. Unless you would all like to move to North Dakota where the wind blows frequently and 10 degrees Fahrenheit would seem tropical, we have to find a way to take that renewable energy and bring it to the load centers that would rather consume that electricity but not necessarily move to North Dakota. No offense to any of you who were born and raised in North Dakota. We were with Senator Dorgan not long ago and he wanted to make sure that no one down talked his state because he loves it. That's pure political talk if I've ever heard it, I'm sure. <laughs> but the truth remains, the solar pattern of this country runs on, a, on an east-west pattern on the southern tier of states, Texas across to the Californias. The wind process runs on a north-south direction from the North Dakota down into Texas. And the population centers, for the most part, are some in the Middle West. I know those of you who live on the coasts believe that you just fly over those states, but there are a lot of people there, rest assured. And we have to find a way to get that done. This electric transmission grid that we speak about is built off of a tremendous amount of history. Some of you may be familiar with American Electric Power. I'm certain many of you are not. We began business in, uh, in the year 1904, incorporated here in New York City, and stayed here until 1980, and designed probably one of the most unique concepts in the electric utility business at the time, and said, very bright engineers that managed the company back in that timeline, probably much brighter than today's group, let's put our power production facilities at the fuel source, and let's transmit the electrons to the load centers. And so we started something very different than most utilities who did just the opposite. Power plants very near the demand cycle. As you know, Edison, this Pearl Street station, was to take care of customers only a block or two away. We, because of that mind mouth approach to our power plants, developed the largest electrical transmission system in North America. And we built that to a 765,000 volt system to carry that energy from its point of origin to the point of consumption. Our concept now builds off of the same concept that Dwight Eisenhower brought back with him, not only from the war, but if you listen to his granddaughter tell the loving story about Ike's early assignment in 1919 to be in a convoy to bring facilities from California to Washington, D.C. in what the Army <coughs> vernacular calls deuce and a half. Any of you who got drafted or were in the war understand 
what a deuce and a half is. It's a very big, slow-moving vehicle, and it took them months to go that far. Coming back from the war, Eisenhower clearly saw what he had seen in the German highway system, the need to have commerce be able to move more rapidly to build that system. No one could have known, he surely couldn't have known, what that would have led to. Governor Pataki, who helps tell this story for us, also talked about the great New Yorker who decided to go forward with the Erie Canal and had no idea that opening up that transmission corridor would allow New York City to become the financial capital of the United States and ultimately the financial capital of the world. So in that same concept, what we're saying to those who regulate us and those who are deeply involved in allowing these things to happen, let's use that model. Let's allow transmission to be regulated, not at the state level as it is today, but at the federal level so that we can build this interstate national grid that would allow those renewable energy sources to go from point of origin to point of consumption. And equally important, that would allow us to minimize the number of base load central station generation points that would need to be constructed as we go forward. If you think of any geography and think to yourself, well, in uh, middle Jersey, they want to build a new power plant, and uh, just upstate New York, they want to build a second power plant, and, and think uh, almost on the uh, Connecticut-Massachusetts border, a third plant needs to be built. If the system were robust enough to move that energy around, probably only one of those three would need to be done. So the whole concept that we're going to, I think, strives towards many of the goals that this administration has. And it's the simplest concept in the world, and that is give us the federal authority from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, which has that authority for oil pipelines and natural gas pipelines, for electric high voltage transmission <coughs> grid. If that, were to be, if that were to happen, and in that process, as they do with those other facilities, they would address the issue of cost allocation, you would see the transmission grid to be built in a very uh, quick fashion, in a very logical fashion, in an extremely energy efficient fashion, in a capital efficient fashion, and in today's vernacular, something very different from most others. We don't need a tarp to get it done. We don't need a bailout to get it done. We simply need a piece of legislation that would allow the federal government to have the role that it already has in every other asset that deals in interstate commerce. Any of you who have gone through what my professors call the agonizing metamorphosis of lay person to lawyer understand that when products move in interstate commerce, they are regulated by the federal government, not the state government. And that's really all that we're seeking. It seems to me to be such a logical way about doing it. You'll hear many people talk, and you've heard the administration talk, and you clearly have heard my friend from IBM talk about a smart grid. What is a smart grid? The smart grid is something that you need, I need, this country needs, and it has, again, everything to do with this concept that we're talking about. A typical high voltage, yesterday's technology, energy delivery system loses about 7 to 8% of the energy that's generated to the point of delivery. Modern conducting, modern metallurgy, modern computer control on the flow of energy down the transmission grid reduces those line losses to less than 1%. So think about that. If you put 100 megawatts of energy on the existing system today, you deliver 93, 94, 92 megawatts of that energy. On the newer systems, one that we just built going from West Virginia into Virginia 100 miles long, and I know that's not a great length, but 100 miles long, you put 100 megawatts on in West Virginia, deliver 99.3 megawatts in Virginia. That energy efficiency is the beginning of a smart grid. It's the beginning of a control of the flow of electricity so that you could prevent or more appropriately and more quickly react to the events that led to the outages that we all experienced, particularly here in the city, in 2003. Electricity, as you know, at least any of you who suffered through appropriate physics classes or chemistry classes or any of the engineering classes, moves at the speed of light. That day in 2003, the system was telling us at noon that something was amiss. Voltage levels were moving all around, and there was something that just wasn't working right. 
And not until 4 o'clock did the system begin to do what we call in our business cascading. And in 53 seconds, 50 million people were without power. The technologies that are available today would go a long way to saying this voltage fluctuation needs to be controlled and can be controlled, controlled remotely by technologies being developed by IBM, technologies being developed by General Electric, already available to us. So the smart grid begins there. It steps down to the place where you and I consume our energy, and we have an opportunity to put in your hands the tools that will allow you to see how much you're using, how much you're paying for it right now, and it'll roll your bill every day. And you can get a flavor for how much energy you, you can set, you can preset your dishwasher, you can preset your washing machines, you can preset your dryer, you can preset any a piece of equipment to run at X price and not run at Y price. Today, the interface between our company and you, most typically across this country, is you use it. We send you a bill 30 days later. If you believe the bill we send you and you don't call and complain about the meter read, which most of you do, <laughs> but don't need to. But at any rate, and then hopefully 10 days later you pay for it or we shut your energy off. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I wanted to make sure there was at least some humor here. <laughs> But at the end of the day, that's a really awkward uh, commercial relationship to have. And again, you'll see this administration speak to those terms. And again, that's, I guess, why I start with the concept that now is exactly the time. This is a time to do something different. This is a time to take that challenge. This is a time to move forward with clean coal technologies. This is a time to go forward with new nuclear structures in this country. The energy equation can be changed. Some of the great work that Peter does that I know Boone Pickens was here talking to the Manhattan Institute not long ago, says that at the end of the day, this country can also put tremendous pressure on transportation fuels. And if we don't do that, it's impossible for this country to become energy independent. Plug-in electric hybrid vehicles, pure electric vehicles, Technology is near at hand and developable, expensive, yes. But when you layer that in on the concept of what oil might ultimately cost today, we Americans, as we always do, have forgotten the summer $4.90. But just look at the natural gas model today if you're in any of the European Union countries to the west of Russia. And you know exactly what is ultimately going to happen to us my friend Boone calls it, we've been on the oil yo-yo long enough. And ultimately, if demand goes back, and it will as the economies of the world come back, and supply has dwindled to 83, 84 million barrels a day, demand goes to 90, 92 million barrels a day, we'll look at $4 gas and say those were the good old days. Electrification of cars, utilizing our power plant facilities 24-7, running them in off-peak hours, Recharging your batteries uh, while your car is parked in the garage or parked in your own personal garage if you have a home with that structure on it will allow you and I to do something that's very logical, very cost effective, the equivalent of about 27, 28 cents a gallon for the mileage that you would get from that technology. All of that's at hand. Boone's idea, as you know, and he's surely wealthier than me and probably a lot of us, has said uh, you can put compressed natural gas in vehicles, and he ran into a lot of us who said that doesn't make a lot of sense when there's a better electrification concept with plug-in electrics. So he has morphed into taking care of 18-wheelers uh, and moving compressed natural gas into that edge of the marketplace. These are really exciting times in our industry, and there are so few things that we need to move this model forward. Again, I think because it's so unique, uh, there's a great uh, political cartoon out of late, uh, and, and it doesn't matter who takes credit for it. You've probably seen it. There's a little fella sitting on a bench. Just think of any bench here in the city, and he's got a little bag with him that says bailout, and one little pigeon comes up, and he sees the pigeon, reaches in the bag, and throws him a little something out of the bailout bag. Second caption, you can't see the bench. You can't see the guy. There are 10 million pigeons. <laughs> around there. So our view is we don't need your money, 
We just need your authority. We just need you to make this happen. We won't ask for a bailout. We won't ask for any assistance. We can raise plenty of public capital and, pri excuse me, private capital to get this work done. <laughs> small slip, just a small slip, right? So we are eager. We are uh, truly believing that the administration has this vision. We've watched, as maybe many of you have, particularly any of you who are in the energy space with great interest, the interview of the various people being nominated for Department of Energy slot for uh, uh, Environmental Protection Agency Administrator. All of those folks have said very constructive things about these issues, while at the same time they said this won't be easy. Why is it that we don't have that federal model? Because the states have always had that siting authority and the cost allocation recovery authority, and they don't want to give it up. And you can understand the human nature of that. And I'm sure that Thomas Jefferson would argue mightily that this is a state's rights issue. But as you know, it, at the end of the day, it truly isn't, and we would hope that others see it that way. So it won't be easy, but it can be accomplished. And if it is accomplished, just like Eisenhower didn't know that that system would allow commerce to go from the cotton fields or the, co or the tobacco fields of the Carolinas to the massive consumption of California, there's no way the governor could have known that the Erie Canal would allow for commerce to come from overseas into the middle sector of this country. And there's no way for us to truly understand what freeing up that electric grid might yield two decades, three decades down the road, how different the energy diet of this country might be, how different the energy demands of the world might be. I always use China as one of my great examples. China, as you know, chose to do cellular telephones rather than landline because the technology had moved there. Today, many of our engineers go to China frequently to advise them on building their transmission grid. We build 765, China's building 1100. If that doesn't speak about the issue and how one ought to go about handling it, I don't know what else would. So with that, I'll ask JP to join me here on the stage and we'll have his grilling to see if I can make my way through that and then we'll move to Q&A from the audience. Good, well done. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. I'd like to explore the 765 backbone, but before we do, there's a question about the existing grid. And um, Mike and I were talking last week about this and uh, I shared with him the observation that the existing grid, much of the technology and transformers that are there were more or less in place at a time when Frank Sinatra was at the top of his game. And the Beatles had just arrived in New York. The cell phone had not yet been invented and I'm sure a number of people in this room hadn't even been born yet. It's hard to find somebody who can say anything nice about the current grid. Uh, Save maybe me. <laughs> <laughs> well, former Energy Secretary Bill Richardson called it a sort of third world grid. And the president of the American Civil Engineers Group said a lot of equipment is very old. And the president of the, I think, Electrical Brotherhood of uh, Electrical Workers said a lot of the stuff is so antiquated that if we don't do something just to fix or address the existing grid, we could face a 2005 style blackout or sense of rolling blackouts. And you mentioned the fact that South Africa had an issue uh, where its infrastructure hadn't been properly addressed. So could you talk a bit about what we're facing right now, ir irrespective of having a backbone, a super backbone that you described? Clearly, uh, Secretary Richardson uh, has his own problems. <laughs> so I'll leave that where it is at the time. Uh, that comment was cute but not accurate. Our grid uh, is among the most robust in the world. It truly is. It is old, but so am I. And if you're well cared for, you have an opportunity uh, to continue to work and work well. Last year, the investor-owned utilities put about $10 billion to work on the interstate uh, transmission grid, the high-voltage grid. Uh, we continue to modernize it. Uh, but, but Ed Hill, who runs the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, is right. We need to continue put that capital to work. 
Uh, our obligation, and it's an obligation that the men and women of American Electric Power and the men and women who work in the uh, 130 or so investor-owned utilities across this country take that obligation very near and dear to their heart, and that is to ensure that the lights are on. You think of your city, and I know you've had outages uh, in the 60s and in the 70s, and we talked about the 2003 outage, but Con Edison has a, a duplicate uh, looped cable system, 345,000 volts underneath the, the city uh, that serves you all very, very well. 99.9% uh, .9 of the time, now I appreciate that 0.1% when they're not there is a bit aggravating, but uh, it is a pretty good grid, but it does need to have capital put into it. That model's there though, that model is regional, it allows for the flow of energy in a very regionalized basis, and, and that's why we're speaking of this larger backbone grid, which would allow Peter Huber's view of moving uh, electrons from coast to coast and border to border be accommodated. Well, you talked about renewables, and the last time the Manhattan Institute gathered and they had Boone Pickens, he talked a lot about wind. Of course, the dirty little secret about renewables like wind is you need a, a proper grid to take that energy to either coast, even if you have windmills from West Texas up to the Dakotas, uh, where Senator Dorgan can, can have his uh, tropical paradise. So um, you've got one grid that's near completion, is it completed, the 765 transmission grid, to capture some of those wind farms in Dakota. But the truth is, don't we need a nationwide backbone of at least that capacity? You mentioned China has something with even additional capacity. So my question is multifold. If we really need that, how do we get it done? How long is it going to take? How much is it going to cost? And who's going to pay for it? So I, I believe we really do need that without question. I think that ultimately is the answer to do the things that I mentioned, not only to allow renewables to come into the equation, but to minimize the amount of capital that's put in the generation fleet because of the ability to move that energy from point A to point B uh, really will allow us to rationalize how many power production facilities that we have. It will allow many companies to uh, retire facilities that uh, probably because of their current footprint can't afford the investment that will be required ultimately by a more carbon constrained uh, program that we think will happen sometime in uh, the next couple of years here in the country. The whole notion of uh, how much it will cost, uh, transmission usually costs uh, a few million dollars a mile. So you can get to a billion dollars in a hurry, you can get to multiple billion dollars in a hurry. We've seen numbers as big as 60, 70, 80 billion dollars. There was a time when that would frighten most Americans, but now with uh, always speaking in terms of hundreds of billions and possibly trillions, maybe it isn't so. But it's done in a very unique way. It's project by project by project. You wouldn't do it all at once. It would be impossible to do that. The 100-mile line that I spoke to earlier on from West Virginia to Virginia, just to give you a flavor of the issue today versus what we think could happen tomorrow, took 16 years from beginning to end. It took 13 and a half years to get authority to build it, and then the rest of the time to physically build it. It's a, a tremendous engineering accomplishment when you see it. It, it really is uh, breathtaking, and not everyone sees transmission towers in the same light that I do. I think they're really massive engineer uh, phenoms, and others think they're ugly interventions in a beautiful vista. Uh, who would pay for it? The customers. Uh, who have the kilowatts who move down the system would pay for it. And, and think, about, think about this. Uh, in the introduction, you, you heard that I had the honor of uh, being the CEO of Northeast Utilities uh, that serves all of Connecticut, save New Haven, the western half of Massachusetts, and all of New Hampshire, save a couple of small parts in upstate New Hampshire. And uh, Northeast Utilities has built out about uh, $2 billion worth of uh, transmission because they have a multi-state agreement in the New England states that allow for these kinds of things to happen. The electric rate went up by mills per kilowatt hour, not cents per kilowatt hour, because if you think of this national grid, and you really think about literally billions of kilowatt hours flowing over it, and each of them paying for that right to go down that system, uh, it's a pretty small event as that you would see on your electric bill at home, and particularly, again, if you buy Peter's logic of today, you know, you'd say to yourself, well, who doesn't like this idea, Mike? I've already identified one group that's troubled by it, and that's the state regulator that 
they believe they have that authority today and they, of human nature, don't want to give it up. The other person who really thinks this is a terrible idea is the person who owns a power plant in Manhattan that's landlocked in an electric sense. Because on the hottest day in the summer months and the muggiest day here in the city, they can charge you whatever you're willing to pay, and you folks are willing to pay a lot. You pay on average 16, 17 cents a kilowatt hour. Our service territory is about seven and a half cents a kilowatt hour. We'd love to have you relocate to the Middle West. You'd enjoy it. Isn't the average about nine cents a kilowatt hour? Nationally? Yeah, I nationally. think so, yeah. But if you look at the they're very high priced, very high priced. So those who have that landlocked power plant in electric sense, they're the only source in town. One of the few things I understood in economics was if there was great demand and small supply, it got pricey. Getting back to the who would do it, do you reckon the Obama administration would be amenable to uh, giving the federal government that power to override the states to get the permitting? And would this be a public-private partnership, or could this be done by the private capital markets? I want to make sure I uh, get my own faux pas corrected here. It's all private capital. It's not a public-private partnership. It is financeable. And I do think that ultimately we'll come to this. Uh, Senator Bingaman who is one of the principal players uh, in the Senate committee that would be of jurisdiction here, uh, is a big proponent of a renewable portfolio standard on a national basis, which means that every state is going to have to have a certain part of their energy portfolio be uh, supplied by renewable energy. To get that done, you have to support this national grid. The point I'm trying to make, and others have joined us in this endeavor, is to say that to build that out only for renewables would be a capacity underutilization and a real missed opportunity to make full use of the physical facility and therefore the financial facility that one would build to get that done. Mm -hmm. Mike, I want to share a vignette with you. Yesterday I was in Washington, D.C., and I had occasion to use the uh, Metrorail, their underground subway system. And I got to the Metro Center station, and unlike the New York system, which has a very sort of low ceiling, they have this very large, vaulted, cavernous ceilings, if you've ever been down there. And I get off Metro Center, and I see these huge 20, 30-foot posters of these strange creatures holding a lump of coal. No headline, no text. This was the strangest advertisement I've ever seen. One was a mermaid holding a lump of coal, like it was some sort of uh, jar of peanut butter that they were selling. Another was a uh, <coughs> figure like a E.T. or a Roswell, New Mexico extraterrestrial holding a lump of coal. And it was like throughout the entire platform, turn the corner, big sign, there is no such thing as clean coal. <coughs> and the idea obviously was that Clean coal is like these mythical figures, mermaids and extraterrestrials and so forth. Well, I was wondering where this is going. <laughs> Given that most of your plants are coal-fired and that half of our energy is met by coal, this seems to be a prime policy political attack on the very basis of the fuel that propels everything. I'm sure that propels the, the lights we met, have now have. So, Coal is at the heart, still at the heart of what you folks do. Sure. How do you uh, deal with this, such a, an attack of this type? Because it's, it's clearly out there to undermine coal as a source. Well, it, it, it's very difficult uh, to counter uh, those kinds of advertisements. I think everyone has their own ideas. Uh, the issue of clean coal is, is how one defines it. So. Some years ago, there was a concern over acid rain. There was some concern over the quality of air throughout the United States. And the administrations then, the Congress then, uh, passed the Clean Air Acts of 1980, modified in 92, and modified a number of times since. And as I'd mentioned in my uh, walk around comments, that every decade the air has gotten cleaner and cleaner and cleaner, and that's true. Today, we all have deployed technology that didn't cost quite as much as we thought that it would, that captures 90 plus percent of the uh, sulfur dioxides and nitrogen oxides and mercury that's associated in the flue gas of a power plant. Tomorrow we'll deploy technology, and tomorrow isn't literally then, but it's about middle of next decade. We'll begin to deploy technology to capture the carbon, store the carbon. Uh, ultimately, this country or someone in the world ought to come up with a better use for 
uh, CO2 than storing it underground, and we will. And, and to me, that's the definition of clean coal. Perfectly clean, no. But there's no energy source that is perfectly clean. Where do you think the windmills come from? All of the metal that went into the windmills, all of the technology that went into the windmills, all that goes into solar panels, all that goes into a nuclear power plant. So there is no totally clean uh, technology. Those who would argue that we should shutter the coal plants of the United States simply have not thought through the energy issue on a much broader global basis. Just last week, China announced that they're going to up their coal production and utilization by 30%. They are 70% coal-based electric generators today. India is burning coal, will burn coal. Indonesia, Brazil, Russia, countries of the world, and the United States as well. Today, 43 nuclear stations being built in the world, not one in the United States that needs to be rectified. Mm -hmm. And so when I get to the ultimate wish list, if I were to have the opportunity to uh, speak to the president-elect and, and with all of the things on his agenda, no matter what gray matter he possesses, and it appears to be substantial, I would simply say, Mr. President, if you could begin for the first time to create an energy policy for the largest energy consuming nation on the face of the earth, it would be forever life changing in a world sense. Mm -hmm. Well, another reason why I ask that is uh, Stephen Chu, our new energy secretary, who is a uh, Nobel laureate, right? The Nobel yes, physicist, and presumably one who, uh, having earned such a degree, is probably should be expected to be much more level-headed about these things than logical. He has written extensively about that coal gives him nightmares. I didn't realize he was so delicate of mind. Uh, I saw him on C-SPAN also when I was down in Washington. He tempered it somewhat, but do you get any sense from the administration? Because you have feelers down there. You have people who have had their ear close to the ground. Um, that they're going to temper their thinking and be more realistic about the balance of things like coal with renewables? What is your sense? How do you read the tea leaves? Well, had, those of you who had a chance to uh, look at the Financial Times today, it has a great story just to that point, and, uh, and it's got some uh, comments about the secretary or the secretary-designate, I guess. And uh, at the end of the day, you have to come around to the reality of no matter what your impression of coal is, it does, as you point out, JP, supply great, it is 50% of the generation fleet, and it supplies greater than 50% of the generated megawatt hours. And it is essential that it has the opportunity to stay in that space. It can be, and it will be, handled in a more environmentally benign way. It will not be inexpensive. It's technology that's nascent, but it's technology that we're beginning to see that it works. The carbon is captured by an ammonia absorbent. It becomes ammonia bicarbonate. Uh, today, it's being done in a, a facility uh, just north of Milwaukee in a very small level. Our company, by uh, September of this year, will do it at a 20 megawatt level. We'll ultimately, in 2011 or 12, do it at a commercial size 250 megawatt level. <coughs> technology works, we're convinced that it will. It's not inexpensive, but it's a societal decision to address this issue. I only hope that this administration, that the Department of Energy, uh, that uh, Carol Browner as the energy czar, uh, as we reach the international dialogue and discussions, make certain that the world joins us in that endeavor. Because as I mentioned, the carbon footprint of these other nations will continue to grow. And if we burden the US economy uh, and no change in the overall global warming mm -hmm. equation, uh, what will we have accomplished? It's always fancy in today's environment, and, and this doesn't matter where your politics are, for people to blame the sitting administration for the Kyoto Protocol. But people quickly forget that the Senate voted 97-0, 97-0, not to sign the Kyoto Protocol during the term of Bill Clinton. So it, it, it just doesn't make sense for the United States to it says we have to do something. We can't wait for everyone. We can lead here. We can develop this technology and sell it to the world. We should think that's an, an appropriate thing to do. Mm -hmm. And plus, you're right about China. Both China and India have said on numerous occasions, they're building coal plants, and, the, and the, screw the rest of the world. They're just going to go ahead and do it. And so whatever they're going to produce is going to happen, uh, as they say in Texas, irregardless. 
which is a legal <laughs> word, by the way. Uh, <clears throat> last question, I want to open it up, uh, which is on smart grids. <coughs> former Motorola CEO Bob Galvin and former um, Electric Power Research Institute president Kurt Yeager, I think you probably know both sure. folks. Both of them. I've just published a book called Perfect Power in which they advance the whole idea of the smart grid. And of course, it all sounds like Buck Rogers uh, uh, about uh, distributed power and how they say, oh, it's going to uh, threaten the control of the utilities because now every consumer will be able to monitor the flow of energy and so forth. And you can have distributed power. All sounds great. Um, how far away is this really? And what do each of us as consumers need to do to make it, assuming we want it to happen, to make it happen? Well, it's interesting. Uh, uh, that obviously, two questions that are very unique, and they'll tell you a bit about our business. The technology, uh, as far as what's called uh, two-way metering, is already there. The ability to uh, preset thermostats and things, you do that today, I'm sure, in your apartments or your houses, and, and the advancement of that technology is already there and deployable, and General Electric, IBM, and others uh, continue to work in that space, as do the, uh, the folks in uh, Silicon Valley who, who are constantly trying to find another way for Google or others to get in your household and help control events for you. What you and I will do in the process is unique because you'll have very little to do with it. It'll be at the state regulatory level on the distribution system where the state regulator will say, go ahead and put metering technology on the house that allows the consumer to uh, communicate with you from inside their house rather than coming out and reading an old analog meter. You'll then want that technology in your house, and more than likely, companies like ours will be happy to put one in your house just as Ma Bell did years ago with the telephone on the wall. Uh, we'll build that into your rate. It won't cost you any cash outlay to buy it, but it'll be in your monthly bill. But do and home it, builders have to build the stuff into the home they build, or can be retro No, no, because the wire's already there. We're okay. going to control things through the system that's already there. So once you've got wires in your house, and presuming unless you're Amish, you're going to have them, and <laughs> as we find in parts of the country that we serve the Amish people, they've got something going on uh, electrically. But at any rate... Uh, the fact of the matter is you won't have to do much on your own. You'll want that technology eventually. And then the story about utilities caring that their customers know what they're buying, that's good news, not bad news. That, that doesn't frighten us or, or, you know, in the sense of, gosh, the customers are going to know. I would hope that you would. Most typically, what you'll find out is, gosh, this stuff's really cheap. I may want to use a little more. Sorry, Asher, I didn't mean to say that. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is that may well be the equation. Good. Let's open it up. I believe we have microphones. So anyone who would like to, yes, we have a question. Oh, Robert Devlin Schneider. Uh, micro or uh, microphones or coming to you, Rob. Who will own the national grid? Who will own the national grid? Well, I would hope, Bob, it would be companies like ours and others who are willing to put that private capital to work. I think it would be a real mistake. Uh, Senator Reid, the uh, Senate Majority Leader, uh, has a bill that does all of the things that I'm speaking about but it directs itself toward the federal power agencies like TVA and Bonneville Power. Uh, that, again, is just taxpayer money going to a misuse. Today, there are plenty of places for the government to put our taxpayer money that I think would serve them better. We are eager to invest that capital, just looking for that process so the good would be owned by investor-owned utilities. We have a question up here. Bruce? It's a follow-on question. Uh, oh, Bruce, there's a microphone coming to you. Bruce Gelb will ask the next question. It, it's a follow-on question because I'm reading right now deep into Wendell Wilkie and the TVA and what the government did and how he fought against national power. And it seems to me with uh, President Obama having an objective of putting two and a half to three million new jobs to work and talking about he wants projects that are shovel-ready, what you've got is something that sounds like it's almost shovel-ready, and if the government puts the money against it, I can't see how they'll do anything except say, we're not going to let those, those money grubbers in the electric power handle that. We'll take care of it, and then you'll have power throughout the whole country. What, what do you say against that? Well, it, it clearly, it has the overtones of FDR and Wendell Wilkie and the arguments that they had at the time. Wendell Wilkie was running a company called uh, Commonwealth and Southern. It was an investor-owned utility that spread from 
uh, the upper Midwest down into the uh, southeast of the country. Uh, I, I just think it's a long way to go. The government, there are some things the government can do and should do and do well. I wouldn't argue the Tennessee Valley Authority was a good idea, it really was, but it developed a very underdeveloped part of the country at that time and really grew more out of the need of the senators along the Tennessee River Valley to see that happen. Uh, I just think that the government ought to stay out of that space and that's why we aren't asking for the money. I don't disagree with your point at all. If they say here's four, five, seven billion dollars, then we ought not own it. It's the government's money, the taxpayers' money, the people of the country ought to own it. Who's going to run it? Who will make sure that it's maintained? Who will see to it that it continues to flow that energy? Something that we ought to worry about near and long term. Question over here. Uh, Skip Metcalf, Tufts University. Uh, my question is about carbon capture and storage. We know we can do it. We've been doing it with enhanced oil recovery for a number of years. We know we can do it in small amounts. The question is, can we do it at scale? So what do we need besides the, uh, the technology that you're doing at your new plant? What are we going to need to do this at a national level at the scale to really confront this carbon uh, problem? Well, your point is well made. It, 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 it is a technology that refiners and others use at a coal gas plant that was built uh, 